I'm Jason Reichen, and welcome to the Grass Check Podcast, brought to you by AgriSearch, AFBI, and CAFRI. We are bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve grazing management on your farm. This week, we are joined by Kat Houston from AFBI to discuss the latest information from the Grass Check Plots and Farms, Robert Patterson and Noel Lavery from CAFRI, as well as Martin Craig, a Grass Check beef farmer from Crumlin, and Hugh Harbison, a grass check dairy farmer from Akadui. Cat grass growth has again been a bit of a roller coaster during 2021 with a late spring, a massive peak followed by an early summer drought to what is turning out to be a very mild back end. What is current grass growth like compared to the seasonal norm? Hi, Jason. Um, Yeah, so it's been another interesting year. And as you say, we've had two big factors that were impacting on the grass growth curve, that very long and cold spring and a very dry summer. Um, But what we've seen in more recent weeks is really some truly exceptional October weather has been much warmer um, by several degrees at times and much more settled than we'd normally see. So that's produced much better grass growth than we'd expect at this point in the season. Currently, we're seeing average growth rates of about 30 to 35 kilograms dry matter per hectare across the grass check farms. And we're looking at 27 kilograms on the plot sites this week. That's actually 20 kilograms more than the 10 year average of 7.3 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day, the third week of October. What growth rates are you forecasting for the next two weeks? So in the three week average plot measures that we take, um, we're expecting to see the effects of this good weather to sort of continue through in that data. And the forecast is for growth rates of 28 and 27 kilograms over the next two weeks at the moment. I do think though that as we see the weather returning more to normal, and it's certainly been sort of much cooler the past day or two, we're going to see those one week average figures from the grass check farms probably start to fall a bit faster than we see it in the plots. What has grass quality been doing in recent weeks? Yeah, so grass quality has been starting to fall lately, despite those good growth conditions. I think probably some very heavy dews, some very wet days, really producing some of the low dry matter figures that we've been seeing more recently. Um, And ME has started to drop as well. That's going to be partly just because of the shorter daylight hours and the less sunshine that we're getting at the moment to support photosynthesis. And this week, we've got quality sitting on average at 14.6% dry matter, 21.8% crude protein, um, with a metabolizable energy value of 107 In total, how much grass was produced in the plots and farms during 2021 compared to the seasonal average? So on the plots at the moment, we're looking at a total yield of about 10.5 tonne up to this week. That's just over two tonne behind the long-term average figure that we have for 12.6 tonne, and that's based off the 10-year average grass growth curve. So that two tonne represents a 16% drop in dry matter yield so far this season. Most of that last yield occurred in May time and also through sort of July and August with the dry summer weather. And although we're not at the end of October, we've seen quite a different pattern this month with yields of about 160% of the long-term average for October so far. And that's 0.7 ton off the plots just in the last three weeks. So better in October, but it can't make up for the deficit earlier in the year. What we're seeing on farms is really that County Down has seen the lowest yields so far and farms in that area have really suffered the most from the dry conditions this year. Uh, We've got an average figure of 10.1 tonne for farms in County Down and that compares to 12.2 tonne on average from farms in Fermanagh. Hugh, I imagine weather conditions this year have suited you. How has the 2021 grazing season gone for you? Hi Jason, yep, the 2021 grazing season will go down as one of the vintage vintage years in terms of grass growth for here. Got off to a bit of a slow start, obviously with a cold April and dry, and then May wasn't that pleasant either, but from then until now it's just been textbook really. Dry, um, which suits our clay soils, and rain whenever we kind of needed it. We did go for four weeks there without rain, but um, we managed to get away not too bad. There's a few bits in the farm that browned up, but... It's nice to work in the dust rather than the muck. 
Absolutely. Martin, you, your farm is in perhaps a slightly dry area of the province. How has this year gone for you? Hi, Jason. It's actually gone pretty good for us. Uh, we would have heavy and light ground here. We would normally run a couple of hundred stores through the beef and 200 ewes. So uh, it can be a bit tight in the spring, but with the, the good weather there in February, we managed to get slurry out on the, the grazing ground. So uh, by the first week in April, when we we're turning cattle out, use it land the grass was growing pretty good things did get tight during july with a couple of batches fed bale silage and easy feed trailers to them and uh, grazed some of our second cut but i wasn't too worried because we had ended up with a good first cut this year and then uh, just ease a bit of pressure at the end of july we brought a uh, batch of heavy cattle in uh, for feeding and finishing uh, usually by the end of August, we'd be bringing uh, cattle in because we're short of grass. But this year, because it's been growing well, we've been keeping them out longer. Martin, as weather patterns have become more radic, have you made any changes to your grass and management in recent years? I would say the, the main change we've done was split up more of our larger fields into smaller paddocks, basically to try and control the amount of damage the cattle do in wet weather. Uh, rather than tramping around the outside of, uh, of a big field it's contained in a smaller area. So in the next rotation, if we have enough grass, we'll maybe go in and cut that and bale it, give it a bit of a rest from the cattle, and that allows us just to clean up the dirty grass that's become stemmy at that time. It uh, gives it a bit of a chance to dry out. You, uh, have you made any refinements to your grazing management system in, in recent years? I will probably much the same as Martin. We've div- divided a few fields up in the paddocks, been probably like a kilometre of laneways over the past five years and more water troughs, um, bigger supply to the water troughs to um, give the, the cows obviously more water in the dry times and just provided the, the cows with more in and out gates too into paddocks and in dr- wet weather to get them you know, in one gate and out the other. It helps a lot too. Robert, from your experience, what is it that better farmers do to manage grass and avoid shortages or drops in grass quality compared to the average farmer? Hi, Jason. Yeah, thanks. I suppose simply it's it's those farmers who are measuring regularly and accurately know uh, what their grass supply is and also are able to tailor their grass demand to that. Looking back into like the, the drought in the in the summertime, especially down in County Down, you know, we, we had a uh, a spell of you know sort of seven to ten days where there was no rain and there was rumours that there that this potentially might continue. You know farmers who were out there and were measuring uh, and knew what was potentially coming up could could plan for that, extend the rotation length, start to gradually ease in buffer feeding, increase meal feeding, two to four kilos of bales, whatever it was they could they could implement that gradually. There was no sudden abrupt changes in the in the cow's diet and. At the end of that, they still had a great a, a grass wedge, and they were able to come out of that an awful lot better. I suppose more generally, it's flex having flexibility in the system is where those those farmers really shine through. Whether that's in the summertime, having the the, the land flexibility, being able to bring or or take land out of the grazing platform, being flexible in the stock that they have on the platform, being able to 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 bring extra stock in or or move them off the platform. And I suppose in the springtime, you know, we had those cold, slow grass growth starts in the, in the springtime, you know, having the housing flexibility, being able to on off graze, having the flexibility in the grazing infrastructure, you know, having the flexibility to buffer feed silage out the cows either side of milking, having flexibility built into the system is, is really key. No, in a similar vein, what do you see the better beef farmers do differently in their grass and management? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Basically, I agree wholeheartedly with, with with what Robert was saying. You know, when Robert was was talking about the dairying situation there, I would say it equally applies to what the better beef farmers are doing as well. You know, we all know the familiar saying: if you don't measure it, then you can't manage it. So, you know, first and foremost, I would say you need to measure grass. That'll mean you have a, a continual and accurate assessment of of your grass availability, and. With that, then, you know, you'll be able to respond to either a a surplus of grass or a deficit. Following on from that, then, you need to be able to plan ahead. So, you know, what will I do if there is a surplus? You know, for example, will I take out a paddock as as round bales with with your cut of silage? 
And the flip side to that then, you know, what will I do if there's a deficit? Will I reduce demand, example, through a bit of supplementary feeding? Or will I increase the supply, uh, for example, bringing in some silage ground into the, ro- into the rotation? So I suppose basically just to sum up, Jason, you know, the, the two key points for me would be measure grass and, and be able to plan ahead for the what ifs. Martin, what's the grazing situation on your farm currently? Current cover on the farms around 2,800. We still have about 70 cattle out. Growth's been good. I think it was 50 kilos of dry matter per hectare last week, although, as Kat said, we're expecting that to go down with the colder nights and just general colder weather during the day. We're grazing down to about 2,200, 2,400 residuals, and then we just use the sheep to follow after the cattle and clean that up. Hugh, what's the grazing situation on your farm at the moment? Yeah, well, the cows are obviously in, the Milton cows are obviously in full time. They're autumn calving, so um, they're fresh to calve. They come in on Monday. Um, the average farm cover of the farms there is 2,500. We moved 40 year old heifer calves back onto the farm to try and graze some of the higher covers. But we were very fortunate this year. We managed to calve all our cows outside in September. So, and they went straight to grass for a month after the calves. So, we're fairly well on top of the grass this year. No heavy covers going into the the winter time, which is nice, which makes a change over the past few years. So we've um some of the paddocks shut off too that we're going to go to in the springtime already. So they're shut off and ready to go for the spring after um being cleaned out with dry cows. So um things are looking good this year and hopefully we'll carry a bit of quality on the grass through to the springtime. Thanks, you, Robert, given the current conditions, it might be very tempting for farmers to just keep grazing on and on. What are the key steps farmers need to take to set up the grazing platform for the spring? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Obviously, the quality of grass in the springtime is well documented, you know, and, and really good protein and, and energy in the grass in the springtime. Uh, and not only the benefits for the stock of getting out early in the springtime in terms of milk production or beef or like taking yours or whatever it is, but also the benefits of the sward and how that will set that sward up through the rest of the season and getting those covers grazed off and getting light down into the sward. I suppose the, the grass year really starts in August time uh, and it's managed in that autumn period to try and, and set the spring up, which is where your profitability is going to be made or, or lost. And I suppose this time of year, you know, with, with two targets, we're trying to extend the, the grazing rotation into the back end, extend those number of days of grass, but still having that, that eye on, on what's going to happen in the springtime. And I suppose maybe ideally starting to work back from what our closing cover really should be. Ideally, the 20th of November should be, you, you know, your average farm cover should be 2150 to 2200 kilos of dry matter per hectare. And ideally, this should be as flat a wedge as possible, you know, Covers, really high covers or really co- low covers aren't ideal. Um, covers going into the winter over 3,000 kilos, there's going to be a lot of deterioration in that sward over the winter with the cold and wet conditions. You know, you're going to have to have in- increased grazing intensity in the springtime per hectare to get that grazed out. It's probably going to be utilised fairly poorly. You're going to risk poaching uh, and also it's going to take that sward longer to recover in the springtime, uh, potentially creating that deficit going into your second rotation. And and equally, low covers, you know, going to suffer over the winter too. And really, you're not going to have great traffic ability on those covers uh, come the springtime. So ideally, you know, most farms would have traditionally been talking the 1st of October for starting to close up those paddocks going into the final rotation on a 40 day rotation. But as we've seen, you know, growth rates have, have kept very high this year compared to the 10 year average. And potentially, you know, there's going to have to be flexibility in that final rotation this year. You know, maybe some of those paddocks grazed from the 1st to the 10th might have to be grazed again to try and get that average farm cover down low enough. The the issue with, you know, making the 10th of October your, the start of your final rotation is that potentially you're going around that last rotation and you don't get to the end of it because, you know, you have to be realistic. You know, a lot of cows probably aren't going to be out grazing on the 20th of November. So going into that final rotation, targeting grazing those higher covers first, those covers will need longer to recover and um, the regrowth is going to be lower. So it will give those covers longer to recover before the 20th of November. And it also means that if you're grazing the, your lighter covers towards the end of your last rotation worst comes to the worst and you have to abandon your grazing well it's not the end of the world and those covers aren't as high going into the winter time so a balanced approach and every farm's different there's going to need to be flexibility and i would just say keep measuring while your cows are grazing keep measuring and try and aim for that 2150 to 2200 on the 20th of november you no know, going into next spring 
it looks like fertilizer prices will be uh, increasing quite significantly. What steps can farmers take to make sure they make the best use of what is becoming a very expensive product? Well, Jason, you know, I think we should always be trying to make the most efficient use as possible of, of chemical fertilizer, regardless of price. You know, but having said that, obviously, with the predicted prices coming into next spring, you know, this, this is going to bring it into real focus. There's a number of areas which you, you can focus on. For example, regular soil testing and correcting soil pH levels uh, by applying lime. Uh, that's going to increase the efficiency of your fertilizer use. For example, at, at a soil pH of 5.5, you're only getting approximately 75% efficiency of your nitrogen use. But the, you know this will increase to approximately 90% if you increase the soil pH and bring it up to around 6. Another thing you can do is you should be trying to make the best possible use of the nutrients which you have available on the farm. Spread slurry or, you know, as early in the growing season as possible to get the best response from the nutrients which, which are available in the slurry. Another another aspect on, on that subject of slurry spreading is, again, it were possible to use low emission slurry spreading equipment, for example, a, a dribble bar or a trailing shoe, because, you know, this is then going to reduce your, your losses of, of nitrogen from slurry during the spreading operation. You should also be then targeting your less productive swords for reseeding. Newly established swords are going to have a better response to fertilizer than the response that you're going to get from older swords. Again, then on, on the subject of reseeding, you, you should also consider introducing grass and clover mixes when reseeding as uh, your grass clover mix is going to have a lower requirement for fertilizer than, than a grass only mix due to the, the nitrogen fixing properties within the clover. Something else which is very topical at the minute is possibly to consider introducing multi-species swords into your resitting plants, as these are also going to have a lower fertilizer requirement. What I would say first and foremost would be regular soil testing to then allow you to correct any soil fertility issues, which will then allow you to get the most efficient use out of the fertilizer which you're using. So finally, Hugh, on your farm, you have some good, I know it was up there recently, and you have some good clover swords. And I know you've recently established some multi-species swords. How have these gone for you? And do you hope to be able to reduce the amount of chemical N you apply in future? Yeah, well, that's the plan. I think we're probably going to be strong-armed into using less artificial nitrogen just because of the, the price of it. So we're fortunate enough, we've got um, more slurry storage this year and combined with, as Noel said, we've got a trail and shoe coming as well. So hopefully that combined with the extra slurry storage, we're going to be able to make better use of our slurry and those multi-species swords that you've seen and hopefully the, the, the newly established clover and ryegrass swords. That's it for this episode of the Grass Check Podcast. And my thanks to Kat Houston from FB, Noel Lavery and Robert Patterson from Caffrey, and Martin Craig and Hugh Harbison for joining us. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. For more information, you can go to the Grass Check website, www.agresearch.org slash grasscheck and the Grass Check social media channels. This is the final Grass Check podcast for 2021. I'm Jason Rankin and join us in the spring for the next Grass Check podcast. Until then, stay safe.